If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father, nor the voice of his mother, and that when he hath chastened him, will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him, and bring him out into the elders of the city, into the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of the city, This is our son, this our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of the city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. And if a man have a, committed a sin worthy of death, and he, be to, and he be to be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed of God, that thy land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. Let's pray. All right, Lord, I just want to just pray for the sermon tonight, Lord. I just want to help these people, Lord. This is a, just the beginning of the great work, and, and I just want to help. And the people that are hearing me, Lord, I just want to be a blessing to them, Lord, and prepare them, just to prepare for the Christian life. Uh, Lord, we love you, and we just ask you to please bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, the part of the chapter, you got to bear with me. My, I got a cold like a month and a half ago, and this won't go away. We're going to start in Deuteronomy chapter number 21, verse 18. It says, If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father, nor the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him, will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him, and bring him out unto the elders of the city, and unto the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of the city, This is our son, a stubborn, this is our son, this our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of that city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put evil away from among you. And all Israel shall hear and fear. Now what I'm going to be talking about tonight is being stubborn and being rebellious. Rebellion and stubbornness. Now, stubbornness and rebellion is a sin. Some people might say, well, I'm just a little bit hard-headed. I'm just a little bit stubborn. Now, there are some things that maybe we should be a little bit stubborn about. You know, we know salvation is by grace through faith. We shouldn't sway from that. We should right. be stubborn about that. But when it comes to getting sin out of your life, when it comes to hearing God's word, a commandment from God that you're supposed to do something and not doing it, that's the wrong type of stubbornness. That's rebellion against God. That's rebellion against God's word. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Now, <clears throat> number one, what does it mean to be stubborn and rebellious? I'm going to show some verses and let the Bible define what it means to be stubborn, what it means to be rebellious. Now, in verse 20, it says that when a person refuses to obey commands, it says that they're deemed stubborn and rebellious. Look at verse 21. And they shall say unto the elders of a city, This is our son. This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of that shitty city shall stone him with stones that he died. So the Bible's saying right here that one, one uh, definition of being stubborn and rebel rebellious is that you won't obey commands. You know, like a son. Like if I tell my son, go do this, and he just refuses to do it. You know, I think with kids sometimes you tell them to do something, and they may do it, and then later on you know, say, you know, clean your room every day. They get up, they make their bed, they make their bed, and then one day they just don't do it. That's not really them being stubborn. That's just them not doing what they're supposed to do. But sometimes, like let's say I say, Silas, go clean your room, and he just refuses to do it. You know, I'm not going to do it. That's what the Bible's talking about. Now, this is talking about a son. This is talking about some people bringing their child. Now, it's not just a young little child. The Bible says foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. Children do foolish things. Children, you know, they're a little bit stubborn. But this guy that they're talking about is old enough to drink. He's old enough to get drunk. He's a, he says he's a drunkard. He's a glutton. He's just, he just does whatever he wants. He doesn't take any type of correction from his parents. The Bible says that that, that son is supposed to be taken out and stoned by God. Right. So number one, go to Judges chapter number two. Number one is it means to be disobedient. <clears throat> number two, it says in Judges chapter two, Give me a second to get there. It 
It says in verse number two, number 19, it says, And it came to pass when the judge was dead, that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers, and following other gods to serve them, to bow down unto them, they ceased not from their own doings, nor from their stubborn way. So number one, it's just being disobedient. It's just refusing to obey commands. Number two is it says that ceasing from doing your own doings and being stubborn go hand in hand. So it's not just not obeying what God, you know, what somebody's telling you to do, but it's also not wanting to do right at all. You know that what you're doing is wrong, but you continue to keep doing it. Okay? Go to Psalm chapter number 78. In heaven, in <laughs> Psalm chapter number 78. Verse 8, it says, And might not be as their fathers a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright, whose spirit was not steadfast with God. So number one is it's disobedience. Number two is they won't stop doing the same sins. And number three, it says that their stubbornness and their rebellion, it says that set not their heart aright with God. So chronic stubbornness, chronic rebellion is a heart issue. It's not just a works issue, it's a heart issue. Now how, God, how does God feel about somebody that chooses to be stubborn? Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 21, where we started out, the Bible says that that guy was supposed to be taken out, that son was supposed to be taken out and stoned with stones. Now, the Bible doesn't command us to stone drunkards. The Bible doesn't command us to stone gluttons. The problem with this kid wasn't that he was a drunk. The problem with him that he wasn't a glutton or that he was lazy. The problem was that he was stubborn, he was rebellious, and God said that when they took him out and stoned him, God calling it, putting evil away from among you. Is taking it and putting it away from the people. Why? Because stubbornness and rebellion is contagious. Just like all sin is contagious. But if you've got somebody that's just, they're rebellious and they're stubborn, <clears throat> there comes a point to where people are going to see that around you and they're going to see that, you know, let's say with our children. you got one kid that just refuses to do what's right. You know how they always say like the squeaky wheel gets the grease? you got one kid that cries and whines for whatever, just name it. And you got the other kids that are doing right, and they say, can I have this? And we say, no. And then you got the one kid that's asking for it, and asking for it, and asking for it, and you're telling them no, you're telling them no, you're telling them no. And then if you give in to that, what you're doing is you're showing the other children all you have to do to get what you want is just keep being stubborn, keep doing what mom and dad tell you not to do, and eventually you're going to get your way. But when it comes to God's word, when it comes to God's commandments, he's not like that. You can't say to God, you know, God can't tell you to, 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 to do a stop doing a sin. You can't just keep doing it and then eventually God just throws up his arms and says it's okay. You know, that's what we have in this society now. We have a bunch of people in this whole society of America and even in the entire world that think that because the sin is so common, because so many people do it, that it's just okay. You know, in this day and age, you know, you know, in the Old Testament, or 50 or 100 or 200 years ago, it was okay to be a sodomite. It was okay to be a queer. But nowadays, because so many people are doing it, and now it's, now it's just okay. Well, just because a bunch of people do sin doesn't mean that God's just going to throw up his arms like some weak parent and just give in to him. God's not like that. Now, let me ask you a question. How many people in the world tell lies? Probably everybody's told a lie. Does that make it okay? No, that's wrong. You know, how many people, you know, have stolen something? Probably everybody's stolen something in their life. It doesn't make it okay. Same thing applies to different types of sins. Adultery, fornication, which is living with somebody and having that relationship that only married people should have with somebody that you're not married to. When you're uh, uh, being a sodomite, any name the sin, any sin. Any sin that was wrong in the Bible, that the Bible condemns, it was wrong back then and it's still wrong today. Just because our society is so rebellious, just because they're so stubborn, doesn't mean that God's just okay with it. Now, go to Psalm chapter number 66. <clears throat> now, God said that this rebellious son was to be stoned in it. It says, because he wanted to put away evil from among you. I know about a month ago, Pastor Burson's preached a message about sins that will get you kicked out of the church. One of them was adultery, one was fornication, one of them was just being a drunkard. You know why? Because the Bible says a little leaven and leaveneth a whole lump. Right. Sin is extremely contagious. They had, you know, I know that in, in public high schools a long time ago, 
you know, maybe 20 years ago, when a girl came to, to high school and she was pregnant, they'd want to get her out of the school. Because what it would do is it make all the other schoolgirls want to be pregnant, want to have a baby. And I just, you know, I just seen on the news on MSN or something like that, they did a big study. And there's some like famous reality TV show where they follow around like 15 and 16 year old girls that are pregnant and they have, they have babies. And they did a big survey with a bunch of young people in high schools and the majority of the girls say that it glamorizes and it glorifies teen pregnancy. Now these girls are not married. They have no intention on being married. Um, as far as I know and from what a guy at work told me, they're still whoring around. They're doing terrible things, but these are the, but it's, it's contagious. People don't look at it and think this is bad. People look at it and they want to do it. They want to, they want to, they want to commit the same sin that other people make. <clears throat> the Bible says that if people keep committing the same sins, are they rebellious and stubborn about sin? Or if they refuse to believe that something in the Bible that the Bible says is wrong, if they refuse to just, re just accept that it's a sin and they just choose to keep doing it, there's repercussions that happen with that. Now in Psalm 66 verse 18 it says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. When you know that you're doing something that's sinful and you refuse to think it's wrong, are you just saying, you know what, I just personally, I don't think that's wrong. The Bible says you're regarding iniquity in your heart. And the Bible says right there, David was a man after God's own heart. He's a very godly man. He said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. God will not answer your prayers. We go to Proverbs chapter number 28. Which is this. This is the point. You, you hear something in God's word, or you read something in God's word, or you're shown something in God's word, you have to decide right there. You have a, you're at a crossroads. Am I going to just believe that what the Bible says? It says it's wrong. I don't think it's wrong, but the Bible says it's wrong, but I still don't think it's wrong. What are you going to do? What decision are you going to make at that point? Now, it says in Proverbs 28, now some decisions that people have, some decisions are just to not even hear it. They say, well, you know, I just don't want to hear that. They come to a church like this and, and sin is preached against. And sin is, you know, you're told not to be a fornicator, not to be a drunkard, you know, to do this and that, clean up your life. And sometimes people, they won't just be rebellious against hearing it and say, I'm not going to do it. Do you know what they say? Is, you know what, I don't like going to that church because they just preach too hard against sin. I, preach, I know the Bible says it's wrong, but I just don't think this day and age there's anything wrong with it. And they stop coming to church. They don't want to even hear God's word even being preached. Now in Proverbs 28 verse 9 it says, He that turneth his ear away, or turneth his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. So there comes a point, Jesus, you know, the Bible says in one of the epistles, if we deny him, he'll deny us. We can't just go through life purposefully committing sin and think that God's going to answer our prayers. Think that we're going to just do whatever we want. God is some genie in a bottle and he can just, we just rub him and he's just going to come out and just do whatever we want. No matter how disobedient we are to God's word, no. God is an if-then God. If we do this, then he'll do this for us. If we do right, then he'll bless us. If we do what he says, then he'll answer our prayers the way we want them. He's not just going to just give in to us because we refuse to change our ways. Now turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter number 7. <clears throat> so rebellion, rebellion is, is disobeying God's commandments. Is refusing to even hear God's commandments. This, so, you know, rebellion is, is a hard issue, is, is when your heart is not right. You know, I've known this just from raising my children, that if they, if they ever get where they're just really defiant, and sometimes you'll have one of them that just, something's in them, and this, they're, they're not usually the same, they're hard, they're just defiant. It's a hard issue. There's something wrong with their heart. And it's the same thing with grown people and sin. Now, I thought, who are some people in the Bible that are just like the classic example of being stubborn, of being rebellious against God's word? Number one is the Pharisees. Look at Acts chapter number 7, verse 51. <clears throat> this is, this is a Stephen. He's preaching unto these people. He says, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Now, in all those verses that I read at the beginning when... Uh, you know, you start, you know, and I was, you know, getting examples of how to define what rebellion was. Two of the three were examples of Moses telling the people how rebellious they were. Not just how rebellious they were, but how disobedient their fathers were. And he's doing the same thing. He's saying, look, 
You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart. Now remember that. Uncircumcised in heart. You do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did. So do ye. Which have... Which of the prophets have your fathers persecuted? Have, your, have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut in their heart and they gnashed on them with their teeth. So this goes to show me that one... one uh, one kind of reaction that people that are stubborn, people that are rebellious, that they get when they hear God's word being preached, is that they tend to get angry. They tend to bristle at the truth. And instead of just saying, you know what? You know, just like you said today, you know, if you're doing some kind of sin, you know, the only person in life that you can change is yourself. I can't change my wife. My wife can't change me. I can't just change my children. They have, there has to come a point that you decide that you're going to change yourself. And so these people... When they heard that, the Bible says that they got angry. They got they bristled at it. They became stiff necked. He told them stiff necked. Now, go to Deuteronomy chapter number 31. <clears throat> they, they got angry at the preacher. They got angry at God's word. They refused to obey what God said. And not only did they just say, you know what, I don't believe it, or you know what, I'm not going to do it. They actually turned on him and they got angry with him. Now, Deuteronomy chapter number 31. The same thing happens with the children of Israel. Now, when I thought of uh, stubborn and rebellious people, the first people that came to mind are the children of Israel. And they're the perfect example of a complaining, uh, just, a, just a rebellious people. They were just they were just terrible people. They were God's people, but it seems like they were just doing wrong over and over. And I'm going to show you how Moses saw that, and he, uh, and he knew it would never stop. He saw that their heart was so bad, that they were, they, that he, he, he said, you're never going to get this right. Now it says in Deuteronomy 31, 25, that Moses commanded the Levites, which bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying, take this book of the law and put it inside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against thee. So he's telling them, take the Ark of the Covenant and put a copy of the word of the Lord, the covenant of the Lord your God. Why? So it can be a witness against them. Now look at verse 27. For I know thy rebellion and thy stiff neck. Behold, why am you let it, while, I, while I am yet alive with you this day, you have been rebellious against the Lord. How much more after my death? He's saying, look, I'm here with you right now. This is Moses that bring him through the Red Sea. They saw the Red Sea parted. They saw that the angel of the Lord come through and smite all the children of, all the children of Egypt. They saw a great and mighty works with God, and they just continued to be stiff-necked. They continued to be rebellious. And he's saying, look, you saw the miracles. You saw that when I went up on the mountain. I gave you God's commandments. I mean, and, and you still, you're so rebellious. I know that after I die, it's going to get even worse. Look at verse 28. <clears throat> he says, gather unto me all the elders of your tribes and, of, and your officers, that I may speak these words in their ears, and call heaven and earth to record against them. Now, Mo Moses knew that these people were stubborn and stiff-necked. And what he's saying here, he said he bring everybody together. He preached everybody the word, so that way everybody knew they were. He just pretty much put them all on front street. He said, "Look, you guys have no excuse. Nobody here can say that they didn't know. I bring the entire congregation together at one time. Heaven's my witness. You're my witness, and and I'm going to preach you the entire word. And whether you do it or not, it's going to be on you. Now, just flip over to verse chapter 32." <coughs> Go to Exodus chapter number 32. Verse 9. Exodus, I'm sorry. Exodus 32. And the Lord said, in verse 9, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses... I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore, let me alone, that my wrath wax hot against them, that I may consume them, and will make of thee a great nation. And Moses besought the Lord his God, and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with the mighty hand? These people's rebellion and their stubbornness made God so angry 
that he was going to completely wipe an entire race of people just completely off the map. He was going to destroy everybody. Woman, child, elderly. He's going to kill them all. Because he knew, yeah, rebellion and, and stubbornness is infectious, but when the entire congregation is completely infected with this cancer, this, this, you know, this sin of stubbornness, he said, you know what? There's just no way to, there's no way to fix it. The only way that God said I'm going to fix it is I'm just going to just wipe them all off the map. And he said to Moses, because he was obedient and because he wasn't a rebellious person, he said, you know what? I'm just going to start a whole different generation of people from you. <coughs> and, uh, go to 1 Samuel chapter number 15. So we see how, how, what God thinks about being stubborn and rebellious. You know, sometimes people think, well, you know, I'm just, just the way I am. But God says it's a, very, it's a very serious thing. It's one thing to commit sin. It's one thing to commit a very bad sin. Let's say you mess up and you commit some horrible sin. That's one thing. But when you get to a point when you say, you know what? You know, one thing that I used to pray, and you know, I still, I haven't prayed in a while, but I remember praying where I, if I had like a sin in my life where I know I needed to get it out, and every time I would do it, I'd feel bad about it. I pray, God, please, I hope that there's never a day where I don't feel bad about this. Amen. I hope that every time I do it, I feel terrible yeah. until there comes a day when I can possibly get it right with God. Yeah. You know, if you're someone that drinks, and you know, I hope you feel terrible every time that you, you're done drinking. Yeah. I hope you never get to a point to where you can drink and you can, you can uh, do drugs or you can do whatever kind, name the sin, it don't matter. And you can do it and then think that there's no problem with it or God's just going to completely accept it. You know, we're all sinners. Well, God says that's rebellion. Right. That's more than just being a sinner. That's worse. That's right. stubbornness. That's you being a stiff neck. And God looks at that and he says, look, I'm not going to hear your prayers. And, and, and it, it makes God angry enough that he's willing to kill millions of people. He's killed thousands of people in the Bible. And at that point, if it wasn't for Moses standing up and saying something, he was going to kill millions of people. That's pretty serious. Who else in the Bible is a, is a stubborn person? We're going to think about King Saul. In 1 Samuel 15 it says in verse 22... And Samuel said, Hath the Lord, hath the Lord as great delight in verse 22, for Samuel 15, 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord great as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. Look at this. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast re rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Because Saul was rebellious, because when he sinned, this great sin, he goes to the war and God told him, wipe out all these people. And he went in and he didn't kill everybody. God said kill everybody. He even got detailed. All the animals, everything, you're going to go to this land. It's a terrible, wicked nation. Just wipe it all out. People, animals, destroy it all. He went in there and all the good animals, all the good sheep, and all the good... Everything, the ones that were like really good, he kept them. Mm -hmm. And then he, uh, he kept the king, King Agag, alive. He kept the king alive because he was goodly. And God said that he, was, that he didn't like that. That he, that he said it was rebellion. And Saul, his, his, uh, his comeback to that was, look, I'm taking these good animals and I'm just going to sacrifice them to you. I'm going to take these good sheep and I'm going to take these good you know, heifers and I'm going to do a big sacrifice to God. And God says, look, I don't want your sacrifice. I want you to obey what I told you to do. Amen. You know, God doesn't need a sacrifice. God doesn't need the money in the offering plate. What God needs is His people to obey His That's commandments. Right. That's right. The other stuff will fall into place. Yep. You, know, these, to, to, you, know, you know, you should tithe. You should give money to the church. But do you know what? To obey God's commandments that are, that are more pressing to me, that are more... That they're talked about more in the Bible. I believe they're talked about more in the Bible because to God they're more serious than, than some other commandments. I mean, he wasn't going to commit them all. But Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said, you, should, you ought to have done these certain things, justice, judgment, and faith, and left the others undone. If you're going to choose between certain things, you need to knock off these big ones first. <clears throat> now the Bible says here that when God seen Saul's disobedience, his, his stubbornness and his... His rebellion was like witchcraft, and it was like idolatry. It was like he was a witch doctor. I mean, he's, he's saying, look, your stubbornness is like you're, you're a witch doctor. You know, it's just, I mean, how wicked. 
you know? Saul, and then Saul didn't just then Saul didn't just completely, you know, be stubborn in ways that the other guys were stubborn. He didn't just say, oh, nuts to what God says. I'm just going to, you know, not do it. He tried to do it his way. He tried to do God's commandments. Not like God said. He tweaked it just a little bit, and he tried to do God's commandments his way. And God said, look, I don't want you to do my commandment your way. I don't want you to add to what I said. I just want you to do what I said, the way I said it, when I said it. Now, what are some things that, that, are, that people seem to be the most stubborn about? Now, go to Romans chapter number 1. <clears throat> Romans chapter 1. No. Actually, you know what? Go to Mark chapter 9. I'm sorry about that. Just keep on going back. Mark chapter number 9. You're probably not in Romans yet anyway. But number one, I thought people are so stubborn. So people are so rebellious about salvation. You know, they just refuse to, to just accept. Amen. When you show them in the Bible, look, it's... It's salvation. It's simple. It's just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Just put your faith in Christ. We talked to a guy today that was saved. And, we were, and, he, and Pastor Burson just said, look, it's just so simple. You know, we're bringing the gospel message. It's just so simple. It's just so plain. And the guy said, that's why a lot of people don't, don't yeah. get saved. Because it's so simple. The Bible talks about the simplicity that is in Christ. A gospel that's not simple is another gospel. Right. Amen. Because it, said, it, talks, it says that the gospel is simplicity. The simplicity that's in Christ. So... People, they just can't buy into the fact that they don't have to do anything for salvation, that Jesus paid it all. They choose to want to do things a harder way. And so I was going to go to Romans 1 about these people that they just completely refuse to hear God. And then you've got these people that, you know, they, just, they hear the gospel and they, just, they don't want to accept it. And then it comes to the point of the people that you try to give them the gospel and they literally just slam the door in your face. we got people that you knock on their door and if you've been out soul winning, you know it. you got people you knock on their door. What church do you go to Christian church. Oh, I go to Baptist church, and they're like the meanest. They just slam yeah. it on your face, and you're thinking, "Wow, that's pretty. That's very Christian of you." Yeah. You know, the love of God is just flowing out of you <laughs> like rivers of water. Right. You know what I mean? But it's yeah. not. It's like these people are so hard-hearted. These people are so stiff-necked. They're stinking Pharisees with yeah. a Christian name. That's yeah. exactly what they are. Now, <clears throat> you're in Mark chapter number nine. See that for just a second. What is a, a command of God that I believe is probably one of the most disobeyed commands of God is the command to go out and preach the gospel. Now you think about, you take Christian, Christendom, you take all the saved people, the people that are saved, Bible-believing Christians, whether they're Baptist or any other denomination, people that are saved. How many of those people actually go to church? Small few. A lot of people, when we get saved, they're just at home. You know, that. so a small few go to church. Out of the people that go to church, how many of those people actually go out soul winning? It's a very small few. Even in, like, I've been in a couple different churches that were soul winning churches, and the percentage of people that actually go out and preach the gospel is very small. It's a completely disobeyed command of God. Nonetheless, it's a command of God that's a very strong command of God, and it's not just talked about once, it's talked about many times. The most famous one to me is Mark 16, 15. <clears throat> and he said unto them, stay in Mark 9, and he said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. The Bible says that the people that believe not, they'll be damned. Right. The Bible says, how, then, how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard, and how shall they hear without a preacher? You need to go out and preach the gospel. It's a command of God. Amen. These people aren't going to get saved by themselves. John 3.36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. It's clear that the people that are not saved that already have God's wraths upon them. You know, we may look at the Catholic Church, and I said it before, oh, the Catholic Church is sending people to hell. They're damning people to hell. Those people are already damned. Those people already have the wrath of God upon them. The Pope didn't send them to hell. He made it, made, made it harder for them to get saved right. by teaching them his false doctrine. But those people were already saved before they ever stepped foot inside that church. Those people, you go around, knock on doors, you know that the percentage of people in America, a Christian nation supposedly, the percentage of people that are saved is very small. And the, the, Jesus said the, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. The, the amount of people that are willing to go out and preach the gospel and actually go out and show people how to be saved, the percentage is very small. It's a disobeyed command of God. And God just doesn't say go out and do it if you want to. It's a command of God. Now you're in Mark chapter number forty, number nine. <clears throat> Look in verse forty-three. It 
says, if thy hand, And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. For it is better for thee to enter into life maimed than to have two hands and go into hell into the fire that is never quenched. Where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into halt into, halt into life than to have two feet and to be cast into hell into the fire that shall never be quenched, that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not and their fire is not quenched. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. So right there, the Bible, it's hell fire. It's fire and it's hell. It's a place of burning. The Bible says the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. They have no rest day or night. The Bible says that the people that are in hell, they're being burned and they're being tormented and tortured alive. It's a never-ending punishment that had 365 Seven days a week while you're sleeping in your bed at night, in the middle of the night, and you're sleeping, there are people in hell burning. When you're waking up and you're eating breakfast, there are people in hell burning. And they're burning. The guy in, was it Luke 16? Luke 14 or 16 where the, he woke up in hell? What was the one thing that he wanted? He wanted water. All he wanted is enough water to put on his tongue because he was just burning and engulfed in flames. And the second thing that he wanted is for that guy to go and tell his brethren so they didn't come to this horrible place. So as much as the, you know, the people in heaven and God, the Lord, want the people here on earth to be saved, the people in hell, they want the people on, here, on earth to hear the gospel. Right. That guy was fully conscious of what was going on there. He was coherent. He knew everything. He knew what was happening to him. He knew he was there, and he knew there was no hope. Yeah. He never even asked to get out. He asked for a drip of water, and he asked for them to go tell his brethren that they didn't come to that place. It's a place of absolutely no hope. Now, Jesus says right here, if the hand offend thee, <clears throat> he says, cut it off. He says, if the foot offend thee, cut it off. And if the eye offend thee, pluck it out. He's saying it's better to have no hands and no feet and no eyes than to be in hell. He's saying it's better. It's better to have no feet and no hands and no eyes on this earth than to have them all and go to hell. Now, if we saw somebody outside and we saw... You know, a child playing or a child doing something in the kitchen and they were about to do something where they were going to get their hand burnt or their hand cut off or their eye, you know, shot out. We would be frantic to stop them from right. doing that. Right. But you know what? If they, That's not as bad as going to hell. Amen. You got the people around you in your neighborhood. The first thing that we did when we moved into our new house a couple of months ago, the first thing we did is we got everybody at church to come and we just knocked every door in the whole neighborhood. Why? Because I don't want to see these kids walking up and down our street and, you know, Baptist preacher, Baptist Christian, soul winning, independent, fundamental Baptist, just wave hi to them every day and they never hear the gospel. I don't even try and they die and they burn in hell. I don't want that blood on my hands. Amen. Paul said, I am free from the blood of all men. He said, I gave it a shot. I gave it my all. <clears throat> and we have Christians that say they love the Bible. They say they love God. We have, there's people that will not even go to a church if the church doesn't go sowing, they won't even go there and they themselves don't go sowing. They won't go, they won't even step foot and they'll criticize and they'll bash churches that don't go soul winning, but they themselves don't go soul winning. If we're going to be Christians and we're going to be obedient to God's word and not be stubborn and rebellious, let's decide right now, you know what? Maybe I have been a little bit stubborn. Maybe I have been rebellious. Maybe I haven't. Maybe I just haven't done it yet. That you're going to decide tonight that tonight's going to be a day when you're going to just. You know, resolve in your heart that you're going to go out there and you're going to reach the lost. You say, well, I don't know how to do it. You can talk to Pastor Burzins. He can put you on a plan where you can, you can, you can get started. Amen. You know, that's, 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 what, that's what you're going to do. Now, <coughs> Proverbs number, number 18. Proverbs 20, or Proverbs number 18. So what are some things people are stubborn about? They're stubborn about getting saved. And that stubbornness is going to send them to hell. Now, the Christians that don't go so many, they're not going to go to hell for it. But you know what? Many other people are. Yeah. There are going to be many people in hell because of our stubbornness, because of our fearfulness, because of our disobedience to God. There's going to be people burning in hell. It's a pretty serious thing when you think about it. We have a great responsibility. The Bible says that God had given to us the ministry of reconciliation. It's our job to go out there and preach the gospel, the gospel to the lost. Jesus isn't going to show up here and knock on the doors for us. We have to do it. If we don't do it, it's not going to get done. 
That's just the way it is. <clears throat> you know, I thought about this, and I'll do this one quickly. But be stubborn about being friendly. Now, it sounds kind of silly. Like, I'm stubborn about being friendly. I'm stubborn about being nice. But good night. I mean, there's some people, it's like, they're just not nice people. They're just not friendly people. And you think, why? And you know what? I think maybe there, there could come a point in our life where maybe we get, uh, like Pastor Burson was saying this morning, maybe we get selfish and we get self-centered and maybe we're not going to be as friendly to other people and we're not going to show kindness. Now, it says in Proverbs number 18, verse 24, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Now, I always heard that verse said that if you're not friendly to other people, you're not going to have friends. And they read that verse. But that's not what the verse is saying. It's saying a man that hath friends. So is, th is this man, is he trying to get friends, or does he already have friends? He already has them. He already has them. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. The Bible talks about being a good steward of different things that God has given you in your life. If you have friends... You know, if you have a good church to go to, you should try, even if you're just not really an outgoing type of person, you should try to be a friendly person. The things that God has given you, you should take care of them. You know, it's easy to look at these big, fun center churches and then look at, you know, your church and think, wow, they're being so blessed by God. Why is God, why aren't you blessing us? You know, the, the, the enemy of being content, the enemy of content is comparison. If we start comparing ourselves to the wicked and godly churches that are doing everything wrong, you know what? Yeah, we we'll say, well, we're not being blessed of God. But you know what? This church is a blessing of God. Amen. It's awesome. I mean, this, this, is, this is fantastic. You know what I mean? I mean, this is what God wants there to be in this valley. Amen. If I was somebody that had heard of it, if I was somebody that, that loved God's word, I would do everything I could to be a part of it. I would do everything I could to get as close to the people in this church and love the people in this church and be friendly to people and pray. I love the idea of this prayer list. Man, that's, I love that. I, you know what makes people love other people more? And I just like, if you got somebody that <clears throat> maybe you don't like or something that irks you about them, I just heard a good way to get that out of your heart because that's, that's, that's wrong. Right. To just to hate your brother without a cause. It's to pray for them. A yeah, pastor man. said before, if you, if you have a problem with somebody, if you pray for them every morning for seven days, I guarantee at the end of seven days you'll have a problem with them. Amen. You'll care about them. You'll wonder, hey, how they're doing. I met a guy today that I've been praying for. I'd never even seen the guy. And it was cool to see the guy. You know what I mean? It's like, cool, I've been praying for this guy. You know what I mean? And God, God gives us friends. God gives us people. The Bible says in Romans 12, Be kind and affectionate one to another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejo rejoicing in hope. Patient tribulation, continuing instant prayer says, distributing to the necessary necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. The Bible says that that the pastor is supposed to be given to hospitality. The deacons in the church supposed to be given to hospitality, but it says right here that just the Christian in general is supposed to be given to hospitality. Now, what if I said that somebody was given to wine? What if this is this guy is given over to alcohol? That means it's like he's just an, he's a drunk. But the Bible says we're supposed to be like that, but with hospitality. With friendliness and with kindness. We're supposed to be just given over. Should be to a point in our lives that we just can't help but be nice to people. We just can't help to love the people in our church and care about them when they're going through a hard time and breaks our heart. And the bigger this church gets, the more problems people are going to have. You're going to have people in the church that they're going to go through, I mean, hard times. And it should break your heart. You should pray for those people Amen. and it should move you to do something to help those people out. You should be looking for ways you can be a blessing to other people. Amen. Now, <clears throat> go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 2 now. What's another thing that people are stubborn about? And I think this is probably the biggest one. Just in, not just in Christianity, but just in life. Is people are stubborn about being forgiving. About forgiving other people that have done wrong to them. <clears throat> now it says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. Once you get there. 2 Corinthians chapter number 2 verse 9. For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. And I'm writing this to ask to see if you're going to be obedient in all things. That's what it's about, right? Being obedient to God, not being rebellious, not being stubborn, but obeying God's commands. Right. What is something, he says right here, to whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. In verse 10. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I in the person of Christ, Let's, look at this, verse 11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant 
of his devices. The Bible says that the, the tools that Satan has used to destroy the Christian have been the same tools since day one. He's, he, he doesn't, why change? If it's not broke, don't fix it. The methods that Satan has to destroy people have always worked. Till he gets thrown in the pit of hell, he's going to keep doing them. And one of the ways, one of his devices, the Bible says here, is by getting people to not forgive other people. They get, they're unforgiving, they get bitter, and then they start having problems with people that don't even have a problem with them. And the Bible says that that's a device that Satan has. Now go to Ephesians chapter number 4. <clears throat> it's forgiving people. You know, I mean, it's, I mean, and you know what? Let's face it. It's hard to forgive some people. Some people that have done you wrong. And you know what? I found this when I'm just dealing with people and even in my own life. The people that people are so bitter against sometimes are people that really have done the least wrong to them. Compared to like... They've been done wrong, very wrong by these other people, and they forgave them. It seems like it's hard to forgive the little things, because sometimes those little things are just some things that just fester. And they're, you know, you don't even think that you have to really forgive. You think, ah, oh, you know, it's just a little thing. But then what it does is it stacks up, and it stacks up, and it stacks up, and kablooey, you know, if you've been married, you know exactly what I mean. You know what I mean? It's just like, oh, what are you talking about? That was months ago. What are you talking about? <laughs> so, just joking. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31, it says, <clears throat> Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Look at verse 32. Here's the answer. How do I do that, God? And be kind one to another, tender hearted. Ever talk about rebellion and stubbornness is a heart issue? Mm -hmm. Being unforgiving, that's not an action, that's a heart issue. Being bitter at people, that's not an action. It's a heart issue. It says, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, look at this, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Colossians 3.13 says, forbearing one another, forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do he. So think about this. When you're mad about somebody, what kind of sin have you committed against God? Has that person sinned against you like you've committed against God? Probably not. No way. And the Bible says that God has forgiven you. And in the same way that God is willing to just, just perpetually be forgiving to you and still bless you and still love you and still hear from you and still want to help you, you should look at other people and if they do you wrong, you help them. If they do you wrong again, you help them. They came to Jesus and how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times in a day? And he said seven times seventy. You know, what's that, 490 times? But he's saying, what he's saying, like, you know, just keep on forgiving. Good night, man. You know, it's like, this guy is saying he's sorry, and he said, well, he's not, he doesn't really mean it, because he's just going to do it again. Well, you still sin against God. You sin against God, and God forgives you. He knows you're going to do it again, but he still forgives you. In that same way, we need to be forgiving towards other people. Because if we're not, Satan is going to get advantage over us. He's going to hurt us. He can hurt your marriage. He can hurt your relationships with other people, and then you just become this bitter person. And that's when the devil has won, is when he does that. <clears throat> Go to Deuteronomy chapter number 22. Now we're talking about a heart issue. Rebellion is a heart thing. Rebellion is manifested in actions. We, do, uh, we, we refuse to, to give up certain sins in our life, refuse to do things and yeah, those are, those are just evidences of what's in your heart. So, it's, it really, rebellion is a heart issue. Now, go to Deuteronomy chapter number 22, verse 5. <clears throat> Look at this. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are an abomination to the Lord. So God is saying right there, there's a man's garment... And there's a woman's garment. There's some that men are supposed to wear, and there's some that women are supposed to wear. The Bible commands the priest in the Old Testament that they are supposed to wear pants. He calls them breeches. Right. Now, if pants are a man's garment, what are the only other types of garments? We have dresses and we have skirts. See, why would God be so... Why does He care so bad? In, in 1 Corinthians 11, He talks about the length of a person's hair. It says, if a man has long hair, it's a shame on him. Right. And the Bible says that a woman should have long hair, it's her glory. 
Now, why is it such a big deal if a woman wears pants or if a man wears a dress? What is such the big deal about it? Yes, I believe that there should be a difference, but I think the bigger deal is that the way you look on the outside and the way you dress and the way you act, it's, a, it's, a, it's an outward manifestation of what's on in your heart. You see these people that dress and they look like Marilyn Manson. Are they look, I mean, if maybe I don't know how many is around here, but in Phoenix, we see people that just look bizarre. And you think, what's, why do they look like that? Do you know what? It's their heart. It's in their heart. And you know what? You say, well, you got somebody, you know, I think this a lot of women don't even know that the Bible commands women to wear a certain type of clothing and a man to wear a certain type of clothing. You got men that have long hair and they don't even know what's wrong. Right. Now, Bible says nature teaches you that it's a shame. But I mean, this day and age, I think that they've become so cold hearted to them that they don't even know. Yeah. But there comes a point when you're shown it in the Bible and you're showing that it's wrong and you're showing, look, this is what's right and this is what's acceptable to God. And this is not what's right and this is what's not acceptable to God. That becomes a point right then whether you're going to be rebellious and you're going to be stubborn towards God. It's going to be right there where God sees what's in your heart. When you see people that are shown what is right in the wrong way for a man or a woman to dress, and they don't think they're like Saul, and they just don't think it's that big of a deal. They think, yeah, you know, I'm just going to do it my way. I'm going to wear pants and like God said the men to wear, but I'm just going to wear ladies' pants. They're doing what Saul did. They're doing, they're trying to obey God's commandments in their own way. Yeah. They're trying to do things their own way. Now, you got you got a crossroads. you got, am I going to just, you know, I don't like that, or that's completely different than the way I've lived my life? But then, that's the way it is with all sin. That's the way it is with all doctrine. Yeah. You know, it, you come to a point where it's like, look, that's what the Bible says. I'm just going to just, I'm going to do it, because that's what the Bible says. Go to Jeremiah chapter number 4. Now, when it comes to being stubborn and rebellious, I'm going to be closing. But I'm going to give you an illustration that my pastor back, uh, my first pastor, gave. <clears throat> and it was an awesome illustration. We had this little street that's, a, that's down the block from our church. And there was a big bump in the road. It was like a big, like, like I don't know if it was construction or the, the road was broken, but it was like a broken piece in the road. And if you drive on it, it just, you know, your car just hits it. And it's just like this big bump in the road. And it's there for years. And what they did is they put this, they didn't fix it. They just put this big sign, you know those big, those big signs, that it says bump. <laughs> I bet it's still there to this day. They never fixed the road. They just put the sign that says bump. And you know what? That's the way Christians live their life, is they don't want to fix what's wrong. They don't want to fix the broken road. What they do is they just put the sign of, hey, you know, that's just the way I am. You know, it's the way I've always been. And guess what? That's the way I'm always going to be. Yeah. You just put the sign out says bump. Yeah. I have a bump. Yeah, you know, I'm, you know, the rest of the road is fine. Before and after, it's all good. It's just this one little bump. But God doesn't look at it like that. It's not just a little bit of rebellion and a little bit of stubbornness. A stubbornness. It's a little leaven. Leaveneth the whole lump. You pick one subject that you say, I'm just not going to obey this part. This part, I'm going to hold on to this one sin. Eventually, that will spread into right. other areas of your life. That's right. Why? Because it's a hard issue. Now, in Jeremiah chapter number 4, verse 3, <coughs> it says, <coughs> Jeremiah 4, 3, this is, the, this is what we can do to stop the stubbornness in our life. Or something to prevent it. Preventing is better, right? I mean, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. It says, Jeremiah 4, 3, For thus saith the Lord unto the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground, and sow not among thorns. Circumcise yourselves unto the Lord, and take away the foreskins of your... Remember, remember what Stephen told the Pharisees? You uncircumcised in heart. He called them witted sepulchers. It's because he knew their problem was in their heart. Now look what's right here. Circumcise yourselves unto the Lord, and take away the foreskin of your heart, ye men of Judah, and inhabitations of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench because of your evil doings. God right here says that people need to get their hearts right. It's more than just doing right. It's more than just saying, okay, I'm going to do it. But it's having an attitude that says, you know what? The Bible says it. Yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to obey it because the Bible says it. But you know what? I'm also going to have a good heart towards it. I'm going to embrace God's commandments in my heart. You know, I think sometimes, you know, especially as children, we teach the kids, you know, you're going to do this, and you're going to do that, and you're going to do that. And it's more than just telling them and commanding them to do this, A, B, and C. 
It's showing them out of the Bible. Look, you know, I was talking with my wife, and I was saying, they, I was saying like, you know, I probably needed more spankings when I was little. You know, I almost got no spankings, and I was a terrible kid. And I probably needed more spankings, but you know what? That might not have solved everything. The problem was, is what I needed is to be shown how to love God. Because people that love God and love God's word, they're not going to have that same type of problem. I'll go to Matthew chapter number 13. <clears throat> God is saying right there that they need to break up their fallow ground. And sow not among thorns. It says, sow not among thorns. Matthew chapter 13, verse 22, it said, He that received the seed among thorns is he that heareth the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. What it is, is people care more about things that are secular type things. They have more things about than this world, and what it does is it chokes the word of God, and they become unfruitful. These people where it says, so not among thorns, you saying these are people that, they don't care about what God says. They don't care about the things of God, God's word. What it is, is they care too much about the things of this world. Now last verse, go to Psalms chapter 119. You need to stop worrying about what people think of you. And you need to stop sitting, you need to sit down and think about all the reasons that you keep doing the same sins even though you know what the right thing is to do. You need to sit down and you need to have a self-examination tonight. You need to think, okay, what are some things in my life that I need to clean up? Now, I got saved in 2002, in March. I didn't come to church until 2007. I came to church a couple times. I was baptized. Then like, I came like, I can count on one hand how many times I came to church. My old pastor would call me once a, once a year, maybe twice a year, he'd just call me and make me promise him to come to church the next Sunday. And I was the guy that would promise the pastor I'll be there, and I wouldn't show up. And I just was rebellious. And I came to a point where I decided, you know what? I'm burning bridges with all the people in my life. You know, I had drinking. I mean, I was going to jail and just terrible things. I said, you know what? I'm going to get things right in my life. And you know what? I felt like at that point, I was, I was fixing my heart. I was making my heart a little bit more tender. I was making it, you know, to where it came to a point where I just really wanted to go to church and I really wanted to hear what was wrong. You know, I used, I used to say, I used to like getting my face ripped off and I used to like getting my, my toes stepped on. So, so that way I can get these things out of my life. <clears throat> but you need to not only just get your heart right, but you also, doing the things A, B, and C, it's not just that. And it's not just getting your heart right and saying, okay, I accept what God says, but it's doing both. Okay? And there's steps that you need to take. Everyone always gives a worldly excuse why they disobey God. There's no spiritual excuse why you disobey God. You know, I never heard anybody say, I can't go to church this morning because I'm going out so late. I can't go to church this morning because I am going to stay home and pray. I can't go to church this morning because I'm so weak because I've been fasting for three days. No. People that don't go to church and stop going to church, it's because they care too much about the things of this world. You see, well, those things are important. They're not more important than, than, than God's commandments. Amen. That's a fact. You fall out of church, count it down, mark it down. It's because, are you missed church? Okay, you're sick. Okay, I understand that you're sick. Okay, however, the reason why people continually fall out or they continually are just hit and miss at church, it's because they care too much about the things of this world. He's not saying don't care about the things of this world. He's not saying don't take care of business. You need to take care of business in your life. What he's saying is don't take care of business and leave God's business to the side. Now, Psalm 119, 165, it says right here, this is the answer right here. This is a hard issue, right? It says, great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Remember we saw that the people that are rebellious against God, they get angry at God, they rebel against God, it makes them even not even want to hear God's word. How do we keep from doing that? It says, great peace have they which love thy law, nothing shall offend them. We get to a point to where we love God. One, you know what I pray for? I pray that God helps me to love him more. I pray that God gives me some supernatural ability to be long-suffering like I should, forgiving like I should, the boldness to go out soul winning like I should, the ability to love my wife in a way that maybe I, I'm not able to, in a way that only God can love my wife, that I can love my children the way God would love my children. It's a supernatural type of love. It's walking in the Spirit. It's a spiritual thing. And that's what I pray for. I pray that God will help me to love His Word. Because I know if I love His Word, I'll have peace in my life, and I won't become one of these people that get offended at church, and then I'm just gone out of church. Because that's what happens. People get offended. <clears throat> they get bitter. 
They become rebellious. They become hard-hearted towards the preaching of God's word. And then they're gone and you never see them again. I hope that, you know, I don't know if I'm going to be back here before we leave to Fort Worth. But I would love, and my hope is that I'm going to call Pastor Burzens. And I'm going to say, hey preacher, how are you doing? You know, you know and he's going to say, he says nothing but great things about the people in this church. Man, he loves you guys. The people that aren't even here tonight, the, the couple names are, he loves them. We haven't seen this guy. He walked around and he showed me all this cool stuff. You know, it's not that, it's not just a superficial, give me your money. It's, it's, he cares. I would love for him to say, this person and that person, they're still here, man. They're still serving God. They're doing more today than they, they ever have. It's just a blessing to see them growing in the Lord. And that's going to start with having a love for God's word by being uh, tender hearted to the commandments of God and tender hearted to, to the preaching of God's word. And really, it's a personal decision that we have to make, and we have to make it every day. But we can start off by doing it tonight, 7 15. Get ready to close in prayer. We can go home. We can just, you know, let the preaching marinate, let it meditate on it. And decide, you know what? You, you know, the Word of God is right. It's not me that's right. Yeah, if I'm right, it's because the Word of God is right. Just say, you know what? I'm going to do that. It might be hard. And some days it'll be easier than other days. So with the Christian life, it's like going to work. Some days it's easy to go to work, some days it's hard to go to work. But you go to work. You keep on and you keep Amen. on and you keep on. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this church. Lord, I meant every word of what I said. Uh, again, I just want to just help these people, Lord. I want to build these people up, Lord. And I want to see them be successful, Lord. And I love you, Lord. Please bless the couples in this room, Lord. Bless the people that come to this church with, with everything, Lord. With children with uh, just, just success, Lord, in their whole lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.